Bom dia Portugang, to the bime. This is owning a dog in Portugal. Taste good, taste good, taste good, taste good. I've seen quite a few comments mentioning our dogs, so I thought I'd make a couple of videos introducing them, and I'm going to start with Bessie. Before we get into it, I noticed that many of you viewing my videos aren't subscribed. It costs you nothing to subscribe, but it really, really helps me. Click subscribe. Click it. Go on. Click it. So this is our lovely Bessie. She's around five years old. We first met Bessie just before we came to Portugal three years ago. We were in Spain and we'd been to visit a local dog shelter to walk some dogs. And yeah, don't do that unless you're going to adopt a dog because you'll end up adopting a dog. So after a couple of visits, we knew we wanted to adopt a dog and it was funny because Bessie wasn't the obvious choice. We knew we wanted a small dog, a dog that we could take everywhere with us. I'll come back to that later because she comes with us everywhere. Anyway, there were some lovely puppies, but the ladies at the shelter kept nudging me towards Bessie. I know she'd been at the shelter for a while and her chances of being adopted were slim because some people saw her as being ordinary and she was already two and she was actually quite aggressive towards me and almost all males. But, and you doggy people, you know what happened. Something told me to give her a chance because I knew she wasn't being aggressive at all. She was frightened and she didn't know how to handle it. She didn't know what to do with herself and it broke my heart that someone had frightened her so much that she was hurting her chances at ever experiencing love again. We tried her on my lap and she sat, but she shook, bit me and weed on me. No problem for me. We tried taking her for a walk. Difficult. She wouldn't walk more than a few steps. And she certainly felt more comfortable around April, my wife. Anyway, we'd been to visit her three times and it was time to decide. I was sure it could work and I knew I wanted her. April, our sons and I all agreed. So we paid the fee, completed the paperwork and we were Bessie's humans. The shelter suggested that we might choose a new name for Bessie, as Bessie seemed an unusual name for a dog. I asked them how they'd chosen the name, and they told me that after thousands and thousands of dogs, they had to keep coming up with new ways to think up names. Now, they were on opera singers of the 1920s, so Bessie is named after Bessie Jones, a Welsh soprano. Well, I thought that was a fine name and that it suited her very well. So we stayed with Bessie. As well as Bessie, she also answers to Bess, Bess Wes, the potato, the old lady and Chumba Wumba. Well, it took a good month, but me and Bessie were determined to make it work. Something we have in common is a love of medium cheddar cheese. And that's how it started. I'd put a little cheese on a saucer, place it where she could see it and give her space to enjoy it. Gradually, she would come and eat cheese from my hand. We would do things like, my wife and the boys would go out and leave me with Bessie so she could get used to being with just me. I'll never forget the day. She'd been with us about a month when she plucked up the courage to come and give me a cuddle. And we've been besties ever since. And listen, if the manager of Little in Oliveira de Hospital is watching, remember that when you're doing your weekly order. Remember to order that medium cheddar. Because if you forget, it won't be just my heart you're breaking. It will be my little Chumbawamba's heart too. It's your favourite, isn't it, Best West? Yes, it is. It was really within a few weeks of having Bessie that we moved to Portugal and she really managed it well. I mean, it's a lot for a little dog. New family, new country, new language. Knowing how the Portuguese feel about the Spanish, we were worried about her being accepted in Portugal, but she seemed to pick up Portuguese almost immediately and was happily communicating with other dogs as soon as we arrived here. Because we got Bessie from a shelter, she had had her initial vaccines. She had been microchipped and she had her pet passport. While I remember, it's worth mentioning that in Portugal, microchipping is a legal requirement for dogs and cats. Do all people do it? I doubt it. A story for another time, perhaps. But years ago, we actually had the experience of having a lost dog returned to us because of a microchip. So to me, it's a no-brainer. But as I say, shelter dogs are always chipped. Anyway, legally, you need a pet passport, a microchip, and evidence of rabies vaccination to enter Portugal with a dog. Nobody's at the border checking, but guys, you know, just do it, okay? 
After a couple of months of exploring, we settled in Nazare and got Bessie registered with a vet there. We had the address updated on her microchip. This is very important to remember, by the way, as it's not much use having contact details for a different country on the chip. I know, obvious, but in the fog of moving countries, it's easy to forget these things. There are vaccines that are mandatory in Portugal, and your vet will tell you about those, rabies being the most obvious. The fine for having a dog without the rabies vaccine is from 50 to 3,740 euros per dog. And I know that sounds weird, but you see these type of fine ranges all the time in Portugal. Your vet will advise you when to come back for boosters. Oh, unsurprisingly, vets speak English. Yes, we should all be fluent in Portuguese five minutes after arriving. I know, but let's be real. If for some reason you can't afford vaccines, I understand that the Municipal Welfare Service will do it free of charge. If you need that, okay, but don't take the you might want to consider the Leishmaniasis vaccine. It's not mandatory, but it's an awful, awful disease that dogs can and do get in Portugal. We vaccinated both our babies for 70 euros each. I think we had to pay for blood work first, which was maybe 20 euros each or something. We also use pills as a double measure against this disease. It's spread by mosquitoes, as the vaccine is like 70% mm, to 80% effective. Look, if you can afford it, this disease is a real risk and you need to protect your dogs if you can. The usual vaccines like kennel cough, I think that's 30 euros per fur baby, something like that. Again, not mandatory, but most insurance policies cover vaccinations. The easiest place to get pet insurance is through your vet. We pay something like 25 euros per month and that's mid-range cover. I mean, it was just a matter of setting it up and not thinking about it. Does that make sense? It's expensive, but even at 25 euros per dog, I still feel exposed. If our financial situation improves, I'll probably push that up a bit. I know some of you might think that it's crazy, but for us, there's probably no amount of money we wouldn't spend to help them if they needed it. And as I say, you do recover some of that on the cost of vaccines. That also gives us 75,000 euros of public liability cover. I make no judgments. Everyone's financial situation is different and people have to make tough decisions. If you're the type of person who would sell your house to pay for an operation for your dog, maybe try and think of it as house insurance. Legally, you should register your dog at your local Junta de Freguesia, the equivalent of an English parish council, the local village council. Anyway, the annual fee for registration seems to vary between districts, and it seems to vary between free and around 15 euros. I think we pay 7 euros per dog. They'll want to see your residency card, your atestado de morada, your address proof, which you'll have got from them, by the way, and importantly, your pet passport or health certificate that shows your rabies vaccine, well, your dog's rabies vaccine. The first this time, you'll also need to go back during the year to prove you've done the booster. Makes sense, right? Obviously, you only have to do that once unless you move. And trust me, once you've seen the bureaucracy here, you'll never move. Never. Ever. The woman who mans the desk at our frequency here. Mans the desk? Woman's the desk? Anyway, she seemed very bemused and slightly amused when I went to register our dogs. I have a feeling that not many local people actually do this. Who knows? All I know is that as an estrangero or foreigner, the odds of the GNR police bothering me for papers seems higher than it might be for locals. Also, this is where we live in central Portugal. In Nazare, our vet took care of the registration, so check that with your vet. You get a certificate of registration. What I've done, I took a copy and put one in the car and the originals in their pet passports, and I took a photo of the certificates and have those on my phone. So far, the GNR have never asked to see them, but sod's law, if I didn't carry them, me and Bessie would no doubt end up in some Portuguese gulag chipping schist off the Serra de Estrella mountains for 20 years. People tell me that there are dog-friendly cafes and restaurants in Portugal, but we haven't come across them yet. If you're an owner who likes to take your dog everywhere, you'll need to accept that you'll be sipping your galau and eating your pastes donatas outside on the terrace. What's the problem, I hear you asking? Well, it does get cold here, believe it or not. And then, if you're not a smoker, people are still permitted to poison their fellow humans with their cigarette fumes in Portugal. There are a lot of stray dogs, and while they're mostly friendly, keep an eye out. After a while, you'll get to know which strays are softies and which are bruisers. Perhaps surprisingly, we found the giant Serra de Estrella sheepdogs to be among the gentlest, and they're often the strays here in central Portugal, usually older, maybe too old for working, so abandoned. I don't know. Makes me sad. Humans just suck sometimes. Well, most of the time, let's be honest. Lots of municipal parks have fenced off areas where you can let your dog have a runabout off the lead. Generally speaking, they need to be on a lead in public. You won't see much dog poo on the footpaths or streets here, so let's make sure that's another way we're integrating into Portuguese culture. Carry some plastic bags 
bags and pick up that poo. We got a plastic bag dispenser that attaches to Bessie's leash. Problem solved. I think we got that from our vet, but you can get them from the ubiquitous pet supply stores or even from the oh, 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 little china shops. Dogs are usually not allowed on the main bathing areas on coastal and river beaches, but are fine elsewhere. Again, I've never seen dog poo on the beaches here. Portuguese dogs either never poo or folks clean up after them. Let's follow their example. Cleaning up after their dogs, I mean, you should definitely poo at least once a day if possible. I'm a dump before breakfast man myself. We have two dogs, Bessie and Footfoot, and they really couldn't be more different. Very little bothers Footfoot, although he does suffer from nightmares occasionally. Anyway, I don't want to talk about Footfoot too much. He deserves his own video. But Bessie, man, she hates fireworks. I mean, she is terrified. Unfortunately, fireworks are part of life here, and there's almost nothing we can do for her when they're going off. We live in the countryside, and the other thing that sets her off is the crack of the hunter's rifles in the mornings on the weekends. And fireworks can go off at any time here. Portugal is the only country in the world I've been in where they set fireworks off during the day. I can only assume they're braille fireworks. Braille fireworks. For the blind. Okay, I'll get my coat. Something else we need to watch out for in Portugal are ticks and processionary caterpillars. In spring, you need to check your dogs for ticks after every walk, especially if it's in the countryside. And both our dogs always have ticks on them. I'm not exaggerating. Always. Bessie has the most because her tummy is closest to the ground, but she's brown so they're easy to spot. Footfoot is black, so we have to literally feel over his whole body to find them. Footfoot doesn't like to sit still. So it's kind of difficult, but it has to be done. Just as an aside, take this opportunity to check yourself for ticks too. Another thing is processionary caterpillars, so-called because they march in long lines. You start seeing these towards the end of winter, and you'll know they're about because of the fist-sized silky nests in the pine trees. In fact, it's around pine trees where you'll find them. At ground level, they kind of look like a small hairy snake, but it's a line of caterpillars. The hair is very dangerous, and contact can cause severe irritation in humans and doggos. Do not rub your eyes if you you've accidentally touched one of these. The worst case is if a dog touches them with its mouth, and there have been cases of dogs losing parts of their tongues. I've even heard stories of dogs dying who swallowed one of these caterpillars. Anyway, that was kind of depressing. On a happier note, I'd like to say that most Portuguese people here are very nice. We always have people coming up to us when we're out asking if they can pet them. Our kids hate being petted, so we usually suggest that they pet the dogs instead. Look, Bessie suggested that we finish by singing you a song. Are you ready? It's in Spanish. I hope you like it. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap the video up here. If you like this type of content and you're new around here, please consider subscribing. It really, really helps me. And if you like the video, please give it a like. Muito obrigado, amigos. Ciao.